future depends on its ability to fight back. We can no longer be a nation of denture. So, please won't you join me as we bite the bullets and brace ourselves as we cross over the bridge work into the 23rd century. May we become a sea of shiny, smiling, shiny, smiling, shiny, smiling, smiling, shiny, shiny, smiling, smiling, shiny, smiling, shiny, shiny, smiling, shiny, shiny, smiling, shiny, smiling, 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 it is not about the government-issued toothpaste containing an addictive yet harmless substance. No, friends, it is not about the dental re-education centers. It is not about the preventative dental maintenance detection facilities. It is not even about the DNA gene splicing to create a race of winged monkeys to act as tooth-bearing enforcers. No, friends, it is not about any of those things. The fact of the matter is this mandatory toothbrushing law is all about strong teeth for a strong America. Thank you. <laughs> now friends, uh, some of you may be familiar with those particular stump speeches. Anybody here? Uh, because uh, I what, did get a little uh, famous on the internet uh, four years ago, I was invited to the lesser known candidates debate at uh, St. Anne's College. Uh, it's a wonderful event. Uh, since 1972, they've been giving people the opportunity uh, who are on the ballot here in New Hampshire who have not appeared in a uh, national or otherwise uh, debate. And uh, it, it really gives people a forum that would not normally have a chance. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it's uh, clearly uh, a good thing to point out that at any given moment, right now, right here, there are over a thousand people, I mean not in this room of course, but in America today, there are over a thousand people who are running for president of America. It's a very simple thing to do, and it's one of the most beautiful things about America, is that it's a self-declaration. Anybody here in this room can run for president simply by saying the magic words, I'm running for president. And uh, so I've taken advantage of this uh, little fact of, uh, of the world uh, for over 20 years now. I've been coming up to the New Hampshire primary. Once again, of course, because it's, uh, it's uh, ground zero, if you will, for, for the presidential election. It's uh, where it all begins, as you people very well know. It draws in media from around the world. It draws in uh, media from, uh, from the, all across the country and uh, political tours and all these things. And so I've been utilizing this particular format uh, in order to further my agenda. Once again, I'm just a, a, a citizen of, of this great country of ours. And uh, I have my own opinions and messages. Um, and if I were to tell you those opinions and messages, what I really felt, and if I wasn't wearing a boot, if I was wearing a regular suit, if I was on the street corner uh, giving you my opinion, I don't think you'd really care. 
And I, I don't think America would particularly care. And it would just be another crank on the corner uh, saying their piece. But I have managed to uh, use some very simple, elegant, and effective uh, items in my uh, campaign. Um, I wear a boot on my head. They're, it's so simple. Once again, it's very simple. Americans, and yet it's very effective. Um, I, I've talked about uh, using a toothbrush as a toothbrush. It's something that every person owns. It's something that every person has. They're intimate with uh, the ball with a toothbrush. It's in their mouth every day. And, uh, and I took this, a uh, toothbrush, and I talked about making toothbrush a law. Just looking up these two simple things, but it resonates, people get it. The ponies, free ponies for all Americans, people get it. It's a federal pony identification system. You must have your pony with you at all times. So I'm able to address my issues by utilizing these uh, rather absurdist uh, tactics, and, it, and this is what has broken through the barrier. This is what has broken through the, the media. I mean, I've essentially been using a lot of the same material for, for over 20 years, uh, but the people respond to it. They like it. It's whack. Uh, but uh, four years ago, uh, like I was talking about the uh, lesser known President's Forum, um, I was invited uh, because I was on the ballot. Anybody who is on the ballot is invited to participate in this event. In 2008, I was on the, on the ballot and I was invited to attend. And I was ready to attend. Um, but I was unprepared as to what I would actually say. I was going to win it. Um, me and my wife, Becky. Becky, where are you, Becky? Yeah, she's around. She's seen it all before. She's in front of the <laughs> But anyway, we were on our way up to the uh, President's Debate in 2008, and there was a blizzard. A great blizzard, and uh, we were forced to pull over and spend the night on the roadside, and so we did not make it to the debate that year. I was disappointed, but between that time, 2008, and oh, there she is! There she is! I was talking about driving up to the uh, debate in 2008, and getting pulled out of the blizzard didn't allow us to get there. Uh, so it was very interesting because that was Obama's. Uh, you know, that's when he got elected. Uh -huh. So it. In, the, in between 2008 and 2012, a lot of different things happened. Essentially, the, the digital migration of all the media to the internet. That happened. Um, the, the whole internet culture became a real thing. Um, the the uh, Harry Potter's movie became a thing. The meme of the wizard uh, became a thing. You know, for many years, I was just a, a young kid with a, with a red beard. I mean, running and, and, and talking stuff on the street. That people were, it was very easy for people to say, that guy's crazy. But in the meantime, because I've become more gray, that, that, that allowed a, a certain gravitas to be applied. Um, the fact that four years passed from the 2008 the Obama getting elected election, that gave people four years to get disillusioned and disgusted and disappointed. Uh, because I find that every year. I've been coming here since 92, and every year you see all these bright and shiny kids who are really getting involved in this candidate or that candidate, and they, they really think it's going to make a huge difference. And I always tell them, Come back in four years and talk to me. Um, so there, there was a certain amount of disillusionment uh, that occurred. And of course, uh, that's always been part of my voting block, the disillusion, the, the disaffected, the, the disgusted, the, the disappointed. Um, so, so there was more people like that. And um, so all, all these things came together in 2012. I didn't know it. I became a meme. I guess I should have seen it coming. I should have been prepared for it. But I was not prepared for it. Um, and so in 2012, at the lesser known candidate debate, I opened with the mentor toothbrushing law speech. It was uh, very unusual, something that uh, people weren't ready for. That I had the boot on my head. Um, people weren't ready for that. It was aired on C-SPAN. It was, it was very confusing for people. It, uh, it turned into this, uh, once again, it was absurd, it was ridiculous, it was unusual. The thing I like about the booth is that I can stand in the middle of any crowd, have, have my picture taken, and you can show it to a kid, any kid, and say, what is wrong with this picture? And they'll say, that has a boot on his head. <laughs> so it, it's a signal that, that, that what I'm going to present to you might not be perceived as you know, correct. Um, in fact, on the Highlight Magazine, does anybody remember Highlight Magazine? Um, I had the honor of 2012. I was drawn in a cartoon in the 2012 back cover of Highlights magazine entitled What's Wrong With This Picture? I was one of the things wrong with the picture. Uh, so, uh, I, and also in, 2000, in 2012, uh, running for president of America on the Democratic ticket was a gentleman named Randall Terry. 
uh, an anti-homosexual, anti-abortion activist who I found uh, rather represent, uh, reprehensible. Uh, he disowned his own uh, gay son. Um, he did horrible uh, things with Operation Rescue. Uh, he was known to throw human fetuses uh, to get his point across. And he was running for president on the Democratic ticket in order to uh, embarrass Obama in, and in order to uh, say he was running for president so he could run his graphic mangled fetus anti-abortion commercials during the Super Bowl. Everybody has a reason for running. That was his. Um, and so uh, during this debate, I was seated next to him alphabetically. Uh, Supreme and Terry, we were right there. And uh, during the debate, uh, I was giving him some very dirty looks. I was mimicking him. Um, I was letting my displeasure be known in, in a fairly nonverbal fashion. Uh, but then during the closing statements, um, I was uh, asked to give a 30-second uh, closing statement. And uh, I, I whipped this up. And uh, every, feel free to sing along. My name is Vermin. My name is Vermin. Vermin, Vermin, Vermin Supreme. My name is Vermin. My name is Vermin. My name is Vermin, 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 Vermin Supreme. When you can vote, and you can vote, and you can vote for president, if you for president if you want to. And and my name is, uh, <laughs> and I uh, pretended to get a little flustered. And, and then I said, oh, and one more thing. And I sort of sat down, and uh, they thought that, that was the end of it. But then I said, oh, and one more thing. And I claimed that Jesus told me to make Randall Terry gay. And I stood up, and I proceeded to dump tons and tons and tons of glitter on his head and on his shoulders and on his body and I sort of did it, I put him in an untenable position essentially. I, I pretty much owned him because he had very, very limited options. You know, what, what can you do when you're sitting there at a public forum, somebody's dumping glitter on you, you can get up and leave, you can get up and swing on the person doing this. Um, you know, there's very limited options, but his option that he chose, which I think was the right one under the circumstances, was he remained seated and took it. And he took all this glitter. And, uh, you know, the, the moderator was, you know, trying to get to stop, and, and then uh, we sat down and I continued to throw glitter in his direction, and it, it was pretty wild. Um, and afterwards, he was okay with it, we shook hands, and, you know, it, it, he was a real good sport. He's a very politic man, he's got a very great sense of humor, I, I disagree with him greatly, uh, but we sort of get along, okay? And so, I did this, and uh, it, it went viral on the internet, and it got super famous, and millions of hits, and then people, all the ponies started loving it, the people who loved the little My Little Pony uh, uh, series, and they all started making crazy drawings of me and artwork, and then they started making songs with my voice and all these things. And, uh, and the, yeah, a shout out to the bronies. And uh, you know, nothing but love came from it, nothing but this amplified love. I mean, I became very well known. I could walk in any street in America and have the boot on my head, people would come up and know me. I can go to any college campus in America today, with the boot on my head, people come up and know me. And they like me, they appreciate me. And it's, so it's been nothing but love, uh, even from Randall Terry. So, uh, recently, uh, I know every four years they have this uh, lesser known candidate debate, and I was very excited about this because, um, you know, it was my forum. You know, this is a national forum. I think it's going to be covered by ABC this go around, and uh, I was very excited. I was waiting for my invitation uh, because I qualified to be in it as uh, giving them my money for the ballot. And uh, I finally found out through the press, through the press no less, uh, Dan Tuvey uh, had this little bit and it said, uh, Vermin Supreme is not coming to the debate but uh, because uh, Neil Levesque, the executive director of the National Institute of Politics, said that uh, unless he, yeah, he can come and debate if he pays the $250 for the cleaning bill. Okay, that was four years ago. I never got no bill. All right, I'm sorry. Um, so I heard this and I figured, well, that's fine. Uh, I'll do a little online fundraising. So I, I put it out there and, and uh, people were contributed and donated and I had $250 cash money and I went up there yesterday and I went up there to give him that money, that $250 uh, cleaning fee because I'm more than happy to do that if that's the way, if, if I got to pay to play, that's fine. If, you know, it's a private institution, I'm not complaining about it, lack, you know, free speech or censorship. It's their, it's their party. They want to invite me, they can. Um, so I went up there and uh, he refused my money. Um, he used uh, the word property damage repeatedly. He used the words, uh, there must be consequences for the property damage. Um, I groveled, I was on one knee, I was uh, clearly groveling, I told him I'm groveling. Um, I, I was gonna kiss his feet, but I thought better of it. I, I wasn't gonna grovel that far, because I, I had a feeling his mind was made up. Um, so, he w I, I, gave, I tried to give him the money, and he would not take the money. He would not accept the money. Um, and uh, he said that, once again, that the, the main thing, one of the main reasons that he gave was that 
the poor people who have to clean up the mess, they only received minimum wage, and they were they were in fear. They would be they were fearful that they would get fired if they didn't clean up all the glitter. So essentially, the gentleman was telling me that their janitorial uh, staff does not make a living wage, and they live under fearful conditions. That was my takeaway. Thank you very much. Uh, so today. Uh, and, 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 and I asked him uh, when I was leaving, it's like, well, will, can I sit in the audience? Can I attend uh, the event in the audience as, as an observer? And he said he was going to get back to me today about that through email. He sent me an email, uh, told me that I would not be allowed to participate in the debate. I was not welcome inside the New Hampshire Institute of, Pol uh, New Hampshire Institute of Politics building during the debate, but they invited me, but you are invited to stand outside with other supporters in the pre-designated area, um, and you must obey all uh, college rules and Gosstown police rules and all that stuff. Um, so I'd like to invite you all to a little demonstration that we're having outside of the New Hampshire uh, Political Library on uh, this Tuesday. This Tuesday, uh, about five o'clock, let's say, we'll go and I'll be there. So it, that, that's pretty funny. Uh, I'm not complaining. You know, don't do the crime if you can't do the time, like I'm saying. Uh, but it's just a little thing. I like this funny sometimes, like that. Um, but enough of, enough about me. Um, I'd like to uh, do a little reading, if I may. Everybody okay with that? Okay, this is a, a speech that, um, that essentially was the rough speech that I was going to uh, open with. This was my two minute opening statement for the uh, New Hampshire Lesser Known Candidate debate, and it would have sounded like this. The road to Ponytopia will not be easy. There will be many hardships. There will be sacrifices. The transition times will be tumultuous and uncertain. Not all of us will make it. Yes, the transition to a full, stable, pony-based economy will not be easy. The path will be rocky and perilous, but it will be paved with the glitter-encrusted skulls of our vanquished foes. Woo! Yes, friends, voluntary mandated pony ownership may be resisted by some. Pockets of resistance can be expected. It may come down to the hooves and the hooves knots. <laughs> friends, there will be some naysayers pony haters in the beginning there will be those that scream big government these malcontents will be dealt with swiftly and harshly many pundits will argue that it will never work they will be sent to the work camps to be shown otherwise they are impediments on the way to the new utopia they are examples of the dangers of old thinking they are speed bumps in a world that has no need for speed bumps anymore. To create a new world almond, you must break a few eggs. Friends, the switch to a pony-based economy will revolutionize the way America does business. Ponies will create American jobs. Ponies will revitalize America. Ponies are a green transportation solution. Ponies produce usable methane gas they will lower our dependence on foreign oil. They are a source of abundant pony-based fertilizer. Am I right? Ponies are the future of America. Ponies have little, tiny carbon footprints on the environment. Ponies are a renewable resource. They are recyclable. They are cute. They are delicious. They are low in cholesterol. In summation, friends, free ponies for everyone. No new taxes and economic prosperity for all. Thank you. Now I'd like to read a short uh, piece uh, that is from the future. It's from my future fan fiction that I've written. It's about life way after my presidency, um, after I've been elected, all my policies are implemented, and what a horrible place it is to be, and why you should not get me elected. So here we go. Are you ready? Okay. There were, harsh rea there were harsh political realities when President for Life, Vermin I, took office. At the time of his ascent to the White House, there were over 300 million Americans in America's previous borders. 
At the time, there were only 300,000 ponies in the whole country. It was a recipe for civil unrest. These were not just political realities, these were reality realities. There was a very stark choice to be made. On the table, would it be the mass execution of some 299, 700,000 Americans in order to achieve proper human pony parity? Or would it be something else? Now, it is certainly true that such a mass execution would create jobs. It would also lessen the country's dependence on foreign oil. It would be good for the environment. Although, there were some drawbacks to consider. Mostly, they were merely questions of ethics and public relations. During this time of widespread civil unrest, all options were on the table. The dental high command was put on high alert. The dental re-education camps were ready. Homeland Dental Security coordinated with the nation's dental police departments. The militarization of America's dental police forces had been a great idea that was about to pay off in lower incidences of gum disease nationwide. There were riots in the streets of numerous cities. Pulsating water pick cannons knocked rioters off their feet and knocked the black right off of their teeth. The population was demanding their ponies, ponies that were nowhere in sight. It was a time of heightened international tension. No one would have blamed Tyrant Supreme if he had ordered the National Dental Guard to carry out a full-scale massacre of the civilian population. It was high time, actually. The veneer of civility that had protected Americans from such real political unrest for quite some time was wearing thin. The quaint and often repeated notion that it can't happen here was truly just a lack of imagination. It did not help at all that recently installed dictator forever Bourbon Supreme was completely and utterly insane. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions. Anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, yes, you waving your hand with the, with the suit there. Mr. The Supreme. Yes, sir. You're an advocate for a pony-based economy. Mr. Supreme is an advocate for a pony-based economy, and I commend you. Thank you, sir. At one time, our greenbacks, our money was backed by gold. They called it the gold standard. Yeah. Now it's backed by nothing. If and when you become president, what commodity do you advocate to back up our money to give it credibility? Well, that's a very good question, sir. I'm very glad you asked, because many people often ask me, uh, Vermin, uh, is it true that in this pony-based economy, you will be using actual ponies as currency? And uh, friends, I have to say that until we can make them very, very small to fit in our pockets and make change with, probably not. However, and some question whether we will even see our ponies, or will they simply, will we receive fiat currency backed by ponies in the Federal Pony Reserve? Uh, let me assure you, uh, that you will be getting your ponies. And the thing to understand is that once we have our ponies, then we have equity in our ponies. We can use this equity to borrow against. And then we will have established pony credit. Now once we've established pony credit, then we can start to uh, manipulate financial instruments. We can create pony uh, default swaps, uh, we can uh, create a triple A uh, pony bond ratings. And uh, once again, of course, I think we can create a tremendous bubble in the economy uh, with pony debt. Now the thing to understand, of course, is normally, uh, I mean, bubbles are great for the economy when they're going. When they're, when they're going, they're great. It's when they explode, that's the problem. So my pony bubble is going to be reinforced and steel belted and live forever. Thank you. I'm very much. Um, yes, uh, any other questions? I know we have uh, some members of the press, so feel free to fire away if you like. You mentioned uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, using zombies to uh, run generators, correct? How do you plan on uh, having have feeding the zombies? What do you plan to feed them? Because obviously they're not made from energy. 
Well, that's very true. I, I believe the important thing to understand about zombies is uh, that uh, they are carbon neutral, essentially. Uh, they don't produce, I mean, sure, they stink like all heck, but that's why we're going to dip them in urethane, right? All right. Um, I think uh, the important thing about zombies is that, uh, yes, uh, I, it will be a slow and steady climb. Uh, it will, it, in the beginning times, there will only be like small zombie plants for household use. It will be very decentralized. Uh, one or two zombies in the giant hamster wheel turning you, you keeping your television and stuff going. Um, and in order to scale them up, uh, that is where the, where the real trick will be. And I believe that will involve uh, implanting electrodes to sort of sync them up, to keep them going at the same time. Because if they're shambling individually, it's very hard on the gears. Uh, but once we can get them synchronized, um, I truly believe that in addition to uh, recreating the uh, dance routine from uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller, I believe that they will also be able to uh, power uh, giant turbines. I, I see a day when uh, uh, zombie turbines uh, power the nation. And once again, I'd like to take this opportunity to point out that there has never, never been an accidental zombie release from a commercially licensed zombie turbine energy facility. I just want to, and once again, it's not true of the zombie transport industry, but that's separate. That doesn't mess with statistics. Thank you. I hope that uh, sort of answers your question. Thank you. Yes, uh, anybody else? You, uh, you pony. What, what will you do for the ponies? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because uh, some people have uh, hypothesized, mainly ponies, that my mass pony enslavement program uh, is a ploy uh, to somehow uh, evolve the ponies into super smart ponies that will someday take over the planet and um, enslave the humans. Um, that's true, but it's going to take a really long time. So don't, you don't have to worry about it right away. Yes? Um, so if you were to get the nomination on the Democratic side, is there a particular Republican you'd prefer to run against? Uh, once again, at this rate, I believe that I'm on track to uh, not only crushing Martin O'Malley, uh, but, but I also believe that, uh, and of course I've already beaten Pataki, I've already beaten Jindal, um, and I think there's, and who else did I beat? Uh, Graham, I beat Lindsey Graham. Uh, who else did I beat? Walker. I beat Scott Walker. So I, I'm pretty much uh, rolling. And, oh, oh, and this is a fact. This is a fact. I don't know if you've heard this. This came out yesterday. There, the, now, people can bet on anything, and people also bet on uh, the presidential election. I don't know if it's totally legal in this country, but uh, there are bet, there are houses, gambling houses in uh, England that take bets on uh, who will be the next president in the U.S. My odds are currently at 500 to 1. I encourage you all to bet on it and get my, uh, my odds up a little bit. But yesterday it was reported that my odds are 500 to 1. Rand Paul's are 999 to 1. So there are better odds, uh, but according to the uh, betting community, that I will be your president before Rand Paul. Uh, woo! That's what I'm talking about. Uh, so once again, it, it, it's sort of, it's very interesting how uh, my whimsical campaign tends to cross over into reality and, and uh, how I am used to slam a lot of the other candidates. Burbank, tell about the toll booth guy. Oh, uh, once again, of course, uh, on, my, on my way here, two out of the three toll booth collectors knew me. Two out of three. You're going to beat who? Yeah, the, the one guy said I beat Jeb. Uh, he said Howie Carr said I had beaten Jeb Bush. I'm not sure. He might have mixed it up with the Rand Paul thing. I don't know. Uh, and then, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a, and if you were walking down the street with me, if you were here looking here, can you feel the energy, people? Yeah. Can you feel the momentum? Yeah. Who's going to win the election? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can almost believe it. Uh, uh, so, uh, oh, so what candidate, once again, I think it, who will remain standing, quite frankly. I think in 2012 it was clear that I beat Rick Perry fair and square. I received a higher percentage of the vote on the Democratic slate than he received on the Republican slate. I have a very strong suspicion that I will probably be beating legitimately on the New Hampshire primary ballot uh, a handful of the other Republican candidates. I don't want to make any predictions, but there's a few there that who I would certainly love to beat. But, uh, well, they've beaten some of my campaign staff. I'm looking to you, Santorum, Spoons. That was in 2012. Santorum's goons uh, attacked some of my uh, campaign workers. It's on video, and uh, and you can find it on the YouTube, uh, like that. Um, next question, please. I hope, did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm going to take on Trump. You know, it's going to be me and Trump. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. 
with your with your incoming fashion regime, how will you deal with the ponies rights movement and deal with a pony personhood situation? Will ponies have the right to vote? And can I marry my pony? Well, yes, you can marry your pony. And I, I'd be happy to perform that ceremony. I'm uh, registered uh, with the Universal Life Church. Um, first, uh, pony personhood, I believe it would very, be very hard to enslave them uh, if we granted humans, uh, uh, ponies uh, humanhood or, or peoplehood. Um, I, I understand that uh, it is a debate these days, but it's still on the fringe, so I don't think we have to worry about that anytime soon. Uh, the pony rights people, well, we'll just tear gas them like any other protesters. Thank you. Yes, anybody else? Can you talk about how you defeat ISIS? Uh, once again, of course, uh, ISIS, I've, uh, that's exactly right. With, with ponies, with ponies, with armored ponies, with flying pony drones, with like automatic pony weapons and IE pony Ds, and like hordes and hordes of robotic ponies crossing the desert, destroying, searching and destroying every terrorist and an occasional wedding party, and uh, probably nine, uh, uh, I'm gonna try and cut it down. I hear it's about nine civilians to every terrorist killed. I'm gonna try and cut it down to a half dozen. Thank you. Uh, hey, any other questions? Uh, Do you support a two-state solution in Syria? What are you gonna do for the farmers? Do you support a two-state solution in Syria? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that a raising tide uh, rises, uh, raises all floating little kid Syrian corpse refugees. Um, I believe in, uh, that there's plenty of room in this country, plenty of room in this country for uh, refugee camps. There is like miles and miles. In fact, we have all those FEMA, uh, FEMA concentration camps, and I don't see why we just don't retrofit them. Uh, as uh, refugee camps, quite frankly. Um, I'd, I'd like to offer my own uh, Middle East solution. I, I think uh, there's lots of room in Utah. I, I think if the Mormons are, are up for it, we could probably move the entire state of Israel to it. Uh, maybe we could move the entire state of Palestine to uh, Arizona. I'm, it's just a thought. I'm just off the top of my head anyway. Um, and so uh, to, as many states as it takes. As many states as it takes. Because I'd like to point out that uh, John Edwards back in the day, he was pointing out that there were two Americas, and I'd like to counter that there are 500 Americans. Thank you, I'm Vermin Supreme, I approve this message. Now I heard uh, farms, I, I heard, of course, I mean, it, it's, it's great to be here on a farm. I mean, farms, if, I like to eat. Number one, I like to eat food. Ain't got no farms, uh, it's gonna be a little difficult. Um, I've also uh, been known to advocate uh, mandatory victory gardens. That's uh, one of my lesser known planks. Uh, but I believe that uh, the standard American pays some 15% of their uh, weekly uh, income on, uh, on food. I also understand that one quarter of that food is generally wasted. Uh, so I think there's a lot of room for improvement in, in the food supply and the food distribution. And I believe a lot of that would have to do with uh, decentralizing it and uh, having more dependence and uh, sharing and getting our food from local family farms instead of having to spend uh, you know, so much money on uh, gasoline to transport and diesel to transport uh, uh, apples from Washington State. when We could get our apples right here even though I heard a whole bunch come from China too. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm all about the farms. I do not like to see uh, farms and farming communities uh, displaced by uh, condos in suburbia and exurbia. Um, I think that's a, a terrible mistake. I, I believe the uh, concentration and solidation, uh, consolidation of, of uh, the farmers into giant agribusinesses is of course not a great thing. In fact, I had just heard uh, recently that it, it may or may not be true, but I'll throw it out there anyway, uh, that uh, Hillary's uh, Campaign manager, or what, one of Hillary's staff is a, is a Monsanto's uh, shill that worked for uh, for Monsanto. Yeah. Um, so, so once again, there, there's like so much big money involved. It, it becomes just a whole nother. It, it's right up there with like pr private prisons for, for business. It, it, they're commodifying uh, the basic things that we need to live. And, and food has been commodified and it's been uh, altered and it's been mixed and it's been turned into these products that aren't really food. And I think that all these things, um, they're problems. They're problems. And, and that's why I, I personally, as a candidate, uh, and as a person, uh, fully support uh, the local food movement, the, the local farmers movement, and uh, I'm very appreciative of, of, of the pony movement. Yes. Hey! hey. Can I hear y'all say, hey. 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 hey! 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 What does 
Hey, Rock Bar, bro. Hey. hey. What's your stance on guns? Uh, my stance on guns is... DUCK! <laughs> <laughs> uh, once again, of course, I believe us uh, more... I believe we need more mind control. Mind control is much more effective than, uh, than gun control. Uh, I will say, and I will speak uh, for myself as a real person here, and once again, I'd like to point out that really, I, I, for, in terms of my campaign, my own personal opinions, I feel matter very little. I mean, the, how I feel about this issue or that issue in the real world, it doesn't really impact. You know, I mean, I have a, a wide range of supporters from, from the left, from the right. Um, I have the, you know, the Occupy left, the, the Libertarian right. And uh, so I, sometimes I, I can't take a, an actual stance without alienating a whole other uh, cons constituent block. Um, so when I, I will say, when I was a younger person, when I was much younger, um, yeah, I was, I was a little knee-jerk. I was a little knee-jerk anti-gun. Didn't like him, didn't get him, didn't think we need him, blah, blah, blah. However, and once again, this is a, I've become real, a politician, I've become more politic. And part of my uh, involvement on the, uh, my understanding and, and the ideas about guns uh, has come about by my, uh, my constituent base, the, the Libertarians and the Free State Project. And, um, the, the folks who uh, hosted me for a big event we had back in, uh, Labor Day weekend, uh, they, they are also gunsmiths, the Shaolin Gunworks, and then they let me shoot guns, and, and there's a, a great video of me shooting guns. And uh, so I can say four square, I'm against gun violence. I am against mass shooting. Um, I've always been a pragmatist, and, uh, and I've never wanted to get into the pundit thing because I don't know if what I think about things really affects things. Um, you know, I respect my people who like guns, I, and I respect their right to like guns. Uh, it, it, it's a complex issue. I, I have my pat, uh, supreme answers, uh, but you know, it's something that I've been trying to come to pistol grip with, if you will. Um, I, once again, during the, uh, uh, during the New Hampshire primary, um, of course, you, you do get to, I went to the State House. I went to the State House to register to uh, be President of America. And I had this vision for many years. And sometimes I have a vision, and I, I don't know what, it, what, it, what the political implications are, what it really means. But my vision was to go in with two uh, long guns crossed on my front, two on my back, one strapped onto each leg. I want you to look really Rambo-ass. Because it's legal to open carry in New Hampshire, it's legal to open carry in the State House. So my, it, my intent was to go and file for the presidency while I was conducting an open carry. Uh, my, my friends, they did hook me up, they did lend me their guns, so when I went to carry, I had a uh, Mausberger pump-action uh, pistol grip shotgun on my back, uh, but I had a flower sticking out of it, and an American flag, and a smiley face balloon. I had a Glock on my hip, I had a 38 Smith and Weston uh, duct tape to the outside of my boot, I had two uh, shotguns in a little uh, golf cart that I was pulling behind me. Um, and so I, I knew I was going to do this open carry, I had called, uh, and I knew I was going to be on right before Ben Carson. I, ben Carson was the last day of filing, he was on at 11.30. I called the state house and said, I'll be there at 11.15. And uh, so then shortly thereafter, there, there's a, a state trooper called me up, their security detail, uh, and wanted to know if I had any requirements or, or needs. And I explained that no, I did not, but I would be doing this open carry. He suggested that I leave it in the car, and I told him it was a more political, arti artistic statement. And he said, okay, but he wasn't going to be in charge, the Secret Service was in charge. And so I went there with all these guns, and uh, we were invited in by the Historical Commission, and so I was in the State House. Uh, I was open carrying uh, the first part, and they wanted me to take pictures with the, with the time capsule. It was very exciting, it was very nice. Uh, and then when I left there, it was then that uh, they, the Secret Service sent me uh, a diminutive Secret Service uh, agent woman, I assumed to keep it de-escalatory, and uh, just asked me to go with her, and I followed her down this aisle, down that, that thing, and then she asked me to disarm. I disarmed. Uh, but also they didn't let me, they didn't let me bring in the guns, but they also didn't let me bring in my big toothbrush, and they did not let me bring in that pony because they declared it to be a weapon. Um, so once again, uh, if, you know, when I do these things, uh, you know, I, that was totally in the script. Then I felt good about it. Becky was very nervous about it. She didn't like the idea of me going to a state house with lots of guns with the Secret Service. Um, I felt good about it. I didn't, I, 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 what could go wrong? Um, but I was ready to hands on my head. I was ready to drop to my knees and do whatever. But you know, I, I felt like it was my right to do it. 
And uh, and so it was part of the plan. I mean, I knew I was going to go there. More than likely, I was going to have to surrender my guns. That was okay, whatever it took. Uh, but yeah, so I hope that answers your question. I mean, I, I do feel um, that it's an important enough right that I've started to incorporate it here and there into my performance. Thank you. Yes? Do you currently own a pony and distribute And if so, um, what is its name? I, I do not have a pony myself. Um, I hope to have a pony someday. I've always wanted a pony. Uh, my friends, Eric and Julie, they have ponies, and um, they let me play with them and visit them whenever I want. Um, the, the I Am A Meme video, you can see me uh, with Munch, the pony, really nice. Um, and if I had a pony, oh, I don't know what I'd name it. I, 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 I come up with a different name every day. What, do you have a pony? No. Yeah. What are Eric's ponies names? Uh, Munch and uh, the other one. Jesse. Jesse, Jesse Munch. Any other questions? Come on, ask me. You get extra credit, right? Go on, go ahead. What's your motivation? My motivation. Very good question. Thank you. You are my motivation, sir. Uh, because I do believe that I have constituents. I do feel like I have supporters. I do have, uh, believe I have an audience and people who enjoy what I do. Uh, and I do a lot of it for them. Of course, I do it for, you know, I just enjoy it to, to no end because it's just so much fun. Um, but once again, at this point, it's sort of this feedback loop where I do anything I possibly can. I do it for the people. The people like it, and so I feel good about it. And, um, and the fact that uh, I can just go right up to any politician and ask them a stupid question, um, the fact that I get to play with police and secret service agents in this, in this context, um, it's, just, it's a very different context than what you might normally find yourself in, you know, normally. Uh, if you're dealing with the cops, sometimes it's a little tense, or it's a little confrontational, and sometimes it is when I am, but I always, am always able to bring it around to like, well listen, I'm here to do this thing, I'm respectful, I'm, you know, I have a, I have a very good working relationship with authority uh, for an anti-authoritarian. That's, that's what I tell them. Thank you. Are you at them? Nope. Just stretch. Okay. What do you enjoy the most about time traveling? Ah, oh, goodness. The thing I like most about time travel is that, that split second before you come back. You know what I'm talking about, right? Whoa. <laughs> You're like, did that really happen? Wow. <laughs> uh, okay, I, if you, I, I, we can show uh, some videos if you like. If you're going to want to stick around a little bit. Um, I've got a movie. Uh, it's a documentary. I think you'll very much enjoy it. If you want to move your chairs over here towards the screen, um, I'll start it up for you in a few moments. Thank you.